one, two, three. Memorial birthday. Thank you for coming today. This is so important. I actually wrote notes. Um, thank you for all of your love and support. Thanks to our friends who have traveled from interstate to those for some <laughs> and from overseas. And of course, there's some of you I know that have come all the way from Perth. Excellent. You didn't have to worry about the equestrian parking then. Uh, before we start, I want to acknowledge the original custodians and people of the land on which we meet, the Manuel and people, who have the years of connection to the land and my respect to their elders, past, present, and the rest. I love that we have this tradition in Australia of an acknowledgement of country with those people. Obviously, it's just the first step, but it's a way for us to connect to our sense of place and to respect those that have come before us, which I think is particularly apt today. I'm not speaking today. Um, Chris will be the only one speaking for the family. That's okay, because as Chris will tell you, he's the best public speaker in the family. <laughs> oh, I love it that I got a round of applause. Uh, we'll also get the last word, and yeah, he knows to cherish that. But to warm you up, we have a number of other speakers, friends from Vernon, online, from BC, from Vancouver, UBC, from our time in Princeton, in Melbourne, in Monash, in Canberra, and ANU, and obviously, it goes without saying, coffee. We're going to try and keep things moving from one person to the next, because there's a lot of people speaking, and there's a lot of you here. Uh, Dad had a lot of friends, but that's the reason why we're here, to share our stories, to share our thoughts, to share our feelings, so enjoy them, make yourself comfortable, for those of you that are here, and those of you online, keep refilling your cups and your plates as we go along, please feel free. Before I hand over to the real storytellers, though, there is one thing that I did want to share, coming back to our connection with land and people. In D.C., where my family is from, like Australia, there's many First Nations groups there that all have their own stories and culture, but they also have common traits, such as a reverence for peaceful animals. Among the First Nations of D.C., the bear demands great respect. The bear is associated with teaching and humility. Yeah. Nice, yeah. The bear symbolizes strength, power, and honor. The bear is a well respected member of the community and treated as a leader among the group. And the bear represents family. I couldn't agree more. But there was a time before there. <laughs> and so, as hard as I made that, <laughs> I'm going to hand over to my brother Joey to read some words from Dad's best friend from childhood in Vernon, D.C., Gord Galloway. <laughs> So I'll just read it directly from what we got from Gord. So it might sound a bit funny coming from me. If you just imagine I'm you know, 50 years older and shorter and with, with a beautiful mustache, but I don't know. My name is Gord Galloway. In 1965, I was growing up in Vernon, British Columbia, Canada. I was in grade five and had been going to the West Vernon Elementary School since grade one. Back in the 60s, the Vernon was a small town. So when something changed, you noticed it. That year, we ended up with a new boy at the school. 
It is an Okanagan land landing which is a few miles out of town. But over the course of that year, that new boy and I started a friendship that was to last over 50 years. That boy was Gary McFarrell. And although to all of you he is there, he has always been Gary to me. Throughout elementary and junior high schools, we saw each other at school. But as he lived out of town and came in on the bus, we didn't get to spend a lot of time after school together. We both were avid musicians, however, and played in the school bands throughout junior and senior year. Gary played trumpet and I played sax. Things changed in high school. We both got driver's licenses. I got a job at a local gas station and soon Gary and three of our other friends were working there. When we weren't going to school or working, we would hang out or cruise around in our cars. There are many stories I could tell you about our high school escapade, but I'm only going to tell you one. One particular Halloween night, we were cruising around with another buddy, John, in his old Valiant. We stopped at a light on the main street when another car came up and stopped beside us. Suddenly, it seemed there were raw eggs coming at us from everywhere. The guys in the next car pelted us with a couple dozen raw eggs and then took off. Naturally, revenge was the only answer. We bought a dozen eggs, waited a few hours, and then went to the house of the guy who owned the car. John turned the lights off and we slowly cruised up the street to his house. His car was in the driveway. Gary was in the back seat. He was already armed with three eggs in his hand. Before I go any further, I need to explain about the window in the back seat of the valley. There are actually two windows. There is the main window, which you can roll down. And there's also a small triangular shaped window just behind that main window, which can't be rolled. This is where the story goes horribly wrong. Gary has always been very strong in his upper body. He took those three eggs and threw them as hard as he could at the car in the driveway. Instantly, we, at the inside of John's car, were covered in egg. Gary drew the inside of that small window with all three eggs. It was a direct hit and there was egg everywhere. John was screaming, Terry was rolled over on the seat going, oh no, oh no. And I was laughing so hard, the tears were rolling down my face. Needless to say, the rest of our Halloween night was spent cleaning the inside of John's valley. We went to the local college for our first year of university, where Terry became incredibly proficient at the game of bridge. Many hours were spent in the common room playing the game. The college had just opened, and for the first couple of years, years was housed in a few buildings on the local army camp. Gary always loved hockey and one of the highlights of the year was all of us sitting in the common room watching Canada play Russia in the summer period. Around this time we decided to move out of our parents homes and with another good friend we got an apartment on Okanagan Lake. Many happy hours were spent sitting around visiting friends and enjoying our newfound freedom. We knew we had to continue our education so we moved down to Vancouver to go to university. We went to the University of British Columbia where Derry enrolled in geology. I went into political science and our third friend went to the British Columbia Institute of Technology. We found a basement suite in Burnaby and we eventually met and became friends with some boys who had grown up and lived in Burnaby. Among them were brothers Jim and John Lover. And through Jim and John and that group of friends, we were introduced to a group of girls who were friends of the boys. One of the girls was a girl by the name of Maria. Maria, <coughs> Maria was a quiet, serious girl who seemed to know exactly what she wanted in life. And before too long a time had passed, Gary and Maria were seeing each other. Maria completed her undergraduate degree in science and then went into medicine. Gary got his undergraduate and master's degree in geology. The years went by and I had been interested in first aid since I had been a ski patroller at the age of 16. And I kept, kept being drawn back to that field. I left university and became a paramedic and spent 32 years with the British Columbia Ambulance Service. Gary and I were each other's best men at our weddings. Gary and Maria moved to Princeton where Gary completed his doctorate and Maria worked as a medical doctor. My wife and I were able to visit them once for, were able to visit them once for a few days, and Gary insisted that I try the ice cream from the dairy in Newark. 
He said it was the best ice cream in the world. And sadly, he was right. And I've never been able to enjoy ice cream since. <laughs> One day I got a call from Derry to say he, Maria, and the family were moving to Australia. He was going to do a postdoc at Monash University in Melbourne. When the postdoc was finished, they moved to the ANU in Canberra. I was lucky enough to be able to get down and see them in both Melbourne and Canberra. Despite both of them having very busy careers, they managed to find the time to raise four incredibly talented and amazing children. <laughs> it has been so much fun watching from afar as the kids grew up and became adults. I still clearly remember the Christmas day, Derry and Maria came over to North Vancouver for a nice casual visit with my wife and me. Maria has always been that calm, cool rock of Gibraltar. A few hours later, she went into labor and Christina was born. We didn't get to see each other as often as we wanted. I retired and moved to Panama, and every few months we would Skype each other and catch up on what each other's families were doing. The calls would last about an hour and always left me feeling great about the world when they were done. As I finish writing this, I am experiencing a lifetime of emotions and memories with Derry. There's always this gentle giant who loves life and his friends, his children, and especially his beloved Maria. I'm going to miss you, my friend. Take care. We all loved you. All right, we will try. <laughs> so you're not seeing double, in case that's what you're wondering. My God, you're a handsome man. <laughs> Anyways, John was outside for a while. He was facing himself, yelling as loud as he could, but nobody heard him. So he'll try it this way now. Um, first, I want to say how appropriate it is to have Bear's memorial on his birthday, as well as Father's Day. I have known Bear for well over 40 years. And uh, when I first met him, he wasn't Bear. I met him as Jerry. I've known Maria even longer. Uh, I met him at a football field behind a friend's place they were visiting. Now, this is North American football. He was playing football with Reed Gordy Galloway. That's what uh, Jerry would call him. I met him through uh, friends of Maria's, it was Deb Marchand and uh, Sylvia Alter and Susan Waller. Jerry was a gentle giant, not somebody you could push over easily. He loved music. Bear had a small basement suite in Vancouver, he was going to UBC, and a group of us would always head down to uh, Vancouver to see him. And I remember strolling up to the, his place, and we could hear him playing the trumpet. And he'd be playing uh, either Chuck Bangiolin's Feel So Good, or the theme song from summer of 42. I remember when we were visiting Jerry last summer, he would entertain us while playing the piano. And he would sneak downstairs at our place and play the piano too. I don't believe a guy that size would actually sneak, but he did. And he would go down there and he seemed to never be able to pass up an opportunity to play the piano. Colby Street, in his 20s, Bear and a couple of his friends, uh, Otis Jarry, Pat Russo, rented a house in Lewis, Minnesota, in the suburb of Safford on Colby Street. This place was known to be called the Colby Street Commodore. That's because everybody would come around and they'd join a party there. There'd be party either weekend or weekday. It didn't make a difference. We all got together and danced and had a few drinks out of Saffron and Crystal, which was actually mason jars. The reason they asked so much there was because uh, Otis had a super sound system. It was one that was uh, two 250-pound Conahorn speakers. Now, back then, bigger was better. I remember when the one time a bunch of us guys went to the house up in Vernon and uh, Jerry and I were walking home from the pub and he just blurted out, I'm going to marry that girl. 
and I thought, oh, he's talking about Leah. And I thought, oh, that's strange. We were both under the influence of it, so I didn't think too much of it. And then Ken really started dating seriously. And I guess, oh, I guess he's speaking the truth. A couple times we were playing hockey with Derek. And I noticed he had three digits on the back of his jersey. I thought that's kind of strange. So I skated up to him and said, hey, Bear, why do you have three digits on the back of your jersey? The digits were 305. He said, well, that's my weight. I said, ah. I said, two things came to mind then. First, I'm glad it was not in contact. <laughs> Second, don't ever, ever get into a corner scrum with this man. <laughs> Jerry was a big man. And like we said, down at Stanley Park, one day we were walking around in Vancouver, and uh, a riot broke out at Stanley Park. It wasn't after a hockey game, but anyways, a riot broke out. And a bunch of us were walking around. And the Vancouver City Police were there. And people were throwing uh, rocks and balls at the police and set a garbage bin on fire. So anyways, as we were walking along, they had the Vancouver City Police there. And they had the mounted steeds. So when the mounted steeds started coming towards us, my brother, uh, he decided to let go of his wife's hand at that time and hold on to Jerry's instead. <laughs> when Gary got his doctor, he would brag that he was a real doctor of the family. He would go around and uh, tell us how much he loved teaching his graduate students, loved doing research at the university. And when we were down in his uh, Australia, he gave us a tour of Canberra and walked around. And he was telling us of all the different rock formations that were around there. And as we're walking back through the path, he would tell us, so he quizzes. us. So what's happening here? What happened here? Well, I didn't have the slightest idea. I failed this test miserably. <laughs> when we were down there, the highlight of our trip was going to the ice rink. And we got to see Bear play and two of his sons. It was a great time, and, and uh, the kids did really, really well. He scored goals. I think Derry may have gotten an assist. That's about it. You know, he's, he slowed down. He wasn't as fast as he was when we played against him. Um, Bear, Bear was very passionate about many things. Music, geology, hockey. But most of all, he loved his wife and his kids. When he came to Vancouver, we were lucky enough to visit him a couple of times. He came over to our place and after dinner once and went to the pub and watched the view and went down there and watched a hockey game on a big screen TV. I have very many, many memories of Terry, but this is my favorite. When we were in our 20s, a group of us decided to play football up in Vernon. It was North American football. And they say we're in our 20s, full of piss and vinegar. And this one particular play, Barry grabbed the ball and decided to go charging through the line, busted through the line. Kevin Phillies, known as KP, tried to close line. He ended up in a crumpled heap on the ground. And Barry was galloping down the field. And I was in hot pursuit. And I remember Gary running and looking over his left shoulder and looking over his right shoulder and laughing and saying, where are you? So he knew I was coming up behind me. As I catch up to him, I thought cursing, how the hell do you get this guy on the ground? How am I going to tackle this giant? Well, Bear was wearing his usual attire. Short sleeve, button up, folded down shirt, cut off jeans, brown belt, and running. So I leaped and I grabbed the hold of his belt and I am being dragged 10 or 15 yards behind him. And as I'm trying to scrap, grab a hold of one of his legs, I finally get a hold of him and trip and we fall into a heap and both laugh in our heads off. That's how I remember Barry, Barry, Barry laughing and chortling the way he did and grinning from ear to ear. Those were the good times. 
and probably something I'll remember for the rest of my life. Every time we got together, Bear and I would relive that a bit. And he would be faster and I would be faster. It didn't make a difference. But we loved to hear that story over and over again. Bear was born in Canada, in a Canadian. But I know his heart is in Australia. It only seems appropriate and fitting that he be laid to rest in this new found country. I will miss Bear, but when I think of him, I will never be sad because of all the good times we had together. They're always full of laughter, good food, good wine, and really good, good memories. Thank you very much, Christina and the Kale family for giving me this opportunity to talk. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, me? Yeah, you. All right. <laughs> Welcome from the great white north. How's it going, eh? That's Canuck speak for good day, Mike. Thank you for the honor and the privilege of speaking at this celebration of Derry's life. You'll have to forgive me for referring to Derry as Derry and not Bear, because Bear was a moniker given to him long after I met him. So he's always Derry to me. First, let me offer my condolences to Maria and her family for their loss. Maria, we've known one another since high school, and my dear, that's a very long time. To lose your life partner on the cusp of your freedom years is more than devastating. And I can't fathom the emotional trauma that you're going through. Uh, you have you have me mentally, but that doesn't help. As for your children, the rest of the sleuth, please accept my heartfelt sympathy for the situation as it has unfolded. We will all get there at one point. It's just terribly, and I'll use a dairy word, bizarre. That we're, all, that we're all here at this point in time because of it. <clears throat> um, above it all, I feel blessed for the opportunity to have spent time with him, go very close to his passing. And that, of course, with Maria as well. I, I really have to give my agnosticism a, a revisit on that basis. Two weeks after 12 years of absence, my goodness does keep one wondering. Derry was a lifelong friend. Now I have lots of friends and I have a few good friends, but I have an extremely small number of lifelong friends. And into that category, Derry fell. Derry demonstrated to me how to think out of the box. So I've told Christina this story, but not the impact it had upon me. So we're at my parents' place having lunch, and my mom asked us to move a dresser. Well, in Australian terms, that would be a bureau into one of the bedrooms upstairs. So we huffed and we puffed and we pushed this monstrosity down the hallway until we got to the door. And we twisted it, and we turned it, and we angled it, and we stared at it, and we swore at it, and there was no way it was going through this door. So I said, well, okay, the door's gotta come off. So downstairs I go to get some tools. Must have been gone four, five minutes tops. Came back upstairs. There's no dresser. Where's the dresser? 
there's no dairy. There's dairy. I go into the bedroom and there's the dresser up against the wall and Dairy's sitting on the bed, chatting with my mom. I said, how did you get that in through the door? She said, I just stared at it long enough until it made sense. <laughs> so later on, my mom, I asked my mom about this and, and she said, yeah, he did. He just stared at it. And you could, you could see the gears grinding and he figured out how to get it all by himself, even though it took two of us to get it up the stairs through that door. Funny the things you remember. Um, I'm just a dumb mechanic, right? But that was an epiphany for me that has lasted my entire life. To this day, when I'm asked to do something difficult and I'm struggling with coming up with a solution as to how to approach the problem, there's this little voice in the back of my head saying, how would Derry do it? And you'd be surprised at how twisting your vision on a situation will give you the appropriate answer. So, when I met Derry one night in the basement of a friend's home and simply offered him a beer, and it became a lifelong friendship. That's all you had to do with this man. He saw the quality of your character from the get-go. This was a guy who, when I met him, was delivering soda pop. All right? There's nothing wrong with delivering soda pop. But the driving a pop truck to getting a PhD from Princeton on a full scholarship, to becoming a professor, to having an accomplished family, at being a world-renowned expert in his field. Good Lord. Right? So when I have new people starting with me, I constantly bring this to, to the, the forbearance. And I tell them that if you're committed to doing something, nothing is impossible. So I hope that I can continue to spread his inspiration as I go through life, because that's really what Derry always was to myself, besides being a good friend. He was inspirational. So at this point, I would ask you all to raise a glass, but with 20 other people scheduled to talk, you're all gonna be hammered by number nine. <laughs> so so I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do you a favor, and I'm gonna do it on behalf of you. He may have graduated, he may have graduated to something else, but when I knew him, when John and Jim knew him, this was his poison. And so not to belabor the point. Thank you for being my friend. Thank you for sharing your life with me. See you soon. We're all going to get there. Um, although, hopefully, in geological terms. <laughs> but you never know. I first met there. In the foyer of the geology department at UBC. I'd recently arrived from England and my eyes must have been as big as dinner plates 
because I, I heard him coming down the hallway in full voice before I saw him. But suddenly there he was, an overgrown schoolboy, looking as if he was having the best day of his life. In England, grown men didn't wear shorts, and it wasn't even summer anymore. After my initial surprise at his size and attire, we became acquainted um, and rapidly became great friends. Bear was keen to introduce me to the Canadian way of life, so he somehow got me onto a hockey team, even though I had never actually skated before. <laughs> Bear's enthusiasm was infectious, and he even used it to convince me to take a challenging course in thermodynamics with Hugh Greenwood and Tom Brown. I have great but somewhat anxious memories of being in class with him, taking turns being in the hot seat or at the chalkboard. We both passed and as you know, Bear went on to tremendous success in that field. Bear defined what it means to be a true friend. He kept in touch despite the miles separating us. And if I was ever thinking it's about time I called Bear, you can bet that he was on the phone first. He beat me to it time after time. He cared deeply about so many of us that are lucky enough to have called him friends, our, our, our friend. Above all, Bear was a proud husband and father. He always spoke so highly of his children and their significant others. They were and are his pride and joy. Bear left us far too soon. We all wanted more but I'm profoundly grateful that his path and mine coincided and that for a few years we were in the same place at the same time. I'm forever grateful that I had the honor and privilege of knowing him. And I think it's a tremendous tribute to Bear that not only Christina, Sean, Chris and Joey, but James, Mona and Nina took a whole month to come here to Vancouver to be together with Maria to begin to heal from their loss. You're all wonderful and our hearts go out to you. Bear was one of my oldest and best friends and it's hard to accept that he has departed long before his time should have come. My heart goes out to Maria, Christina, Jean, Christopher and Joey for your great loss which reflects how much he gave to you. And for that, we must be thankful. We all know Bear was a big man, both in size and in strength, but his physical size was minimal compared to his enthusiasm and his love of people. He had people scattered around the planet who all considered him one of their best friends, and I am very grateful to have been one of them. He lives a big hole in my life, but I will keep him alive and he will continue to enrich my life with all the memories he has given me. I first met Bear when I was teaching an optical mineralogy lab at UBC. What struck me most about him, other than his size of course, were all the questions he asked, challenging me to explain the details of optical theory, and he pushed me to the edge of my ability to do so. He maintained this curiosity and enthusiasm for learning throughout his graduate studies, although they didn't always lead him in a straight line to the most rapid completion of projects, like his master's thesis. However, his enthusiasm was infectious, and along with his songs that frequently reverberated in the halls, was a major contributor to the fantastic experience of being a graduate student at UBC at that time. We shared a love for thermodynamics, and many beverages were consumed pondering applications of the phase rule, the gibbs duhem theorem, and other essential staples of the discipline. Another somewhat less es esoteric interest we shared at UBC was playing bridge. We were particularly avid about it after lunch in the geology lounge, and many, in fact all too many afternoons were passed there, which no doubt had our advisors wondering if we would ever finish our theses. We did eventually, with him completing a very nice experimental and theoretical study on the stability of cordierite. He moved on to Princeton for his PhD work, and then down under where his career really took off and flourished, as I believe we will hear more about today. 
Another memory of UBC days that I'll never forget was playing our first hockey game in intramurals. I was very green, as it hadn't been long since I had graduated from not relying on the boards for balance. It was clear in the warm-ups that a lot of the interest on the other side of the ice was not in shooting or handling the puck, but in looking for opportunities to throw bone-crunching body checks. You could see a few of the opposing team pointing to Bear as if he was Mount Everest, and the chatter amongst them seemed to be who was going to be the first to rise to the challenge. Sure enough, the game was not more than a couple of minutes old before someone took a run at Bear, but when he crumbled like a matchstick, with Bear barely batting an eye, our confidence soared as we knew they weren't going to be running any of the rest of us into the boards that night. One of the reasons I'm fond of this memory is that it reminds me that having Bear as a friend was a lot like having him on the ice that night. Life was much more comfortable knowing that one day soon the phone was going to ring and there would be that baritone voice saying, Hey mate, how's it going? One of Bear's passions was not only playing, but also coaching hockey. I don't know for sure what he was like down under, but I strongly suspect from the success his teams had that he was an awesome coach. He not only had an eye for where improvements could be made, but he also had a knack for delivering the message in a way that was really hard not to accept. In my case, he would often say, You know, for a Yankee, you're a really awesome skater. He said it with such enthusiasm that I actually almost believed him. But then... Perhaps just a little bit too quickly, he would always add, but there's no telling how fast you would be if you had just learned not to drag your toe on the ice all the time. The other memory of Bear that will never fade is ever present in our house. It may sound strange, but I cannot look at the bathtub without thinking of him. The tub is an antique cast iron tub with these strange feet shaped like claws. Bear and Maria had just arrived for a visit when we were renovating and pondering how many people we would have to hire to move the tub up to the third floor where we were putting in a new bathroom. For those unfamiliar with a tub like this, it is every bit of 300 pounds, and I could not budget an inch on my own. Well, as we all know, Bear was not one to turn away from a challenge, quite the opposite. So within a few minutes, I found myself on the bottom end of the tub as Bear grabbed hold of it and started to drag it upstairs. After negotiating the 180-degree bend in the stairs, which had a window at the corner, Bear stopped at the top step with the tub below and started to hyperventilate, deeply and quite frighteningly. He did this for what seemed like every bit of a full minute, because I know I had time to look behind me, see the window, review the laws of gravity, and ponder what an ungraceful demise I would have should Bear's progress up the stairs be suddenly reversed. But as the story is being told, Bear clearly did not fail that day. And I think it was true of just about all his endeavors. He did not fail. You could count on him, always. Now the tub has a little plaque on it saying simply, Bear's Tub, Derry McPhail. In many ways, this memory encapsulates my thoughts of him. Just as I looked up the stairs at him, totally dependent on his strength to survive, I looked up to him in many other ways, too. I was in awe of his unflagging enthusiasm, of his spectrum of talents from the science arena to music to sports, and I had enormous respect for his great love and commitment to his family and his friends. He was a magnificent person and a great friend, and I am going to miss him dearly. Even so, he will continue to enrich my life through the many memories he has given me and my family. May he rest in peace. My name is Jim Lee, and I'm very sorry that I can't be with you today to honor the memory of Bear. Ironically, I'm actually in Bear's country of birth right now, and I always found it interesting that Bear and I led geographically similar lives. First, we're both Canadian. Although we came from opposite sides of the country, he from BC and me from Ontario, we shared the same love of all things from the great white north the Canadian way of life, the beautiful seasons, including snowy winters, and hockey. And we all know that no Canadian would ever need to clarify this by saying ice hockey. (laughs) Bear and I met as fellow graduate students at Princeton, and I will always remember how we first met. 
I was walking down the corridor in the basement of the geology building, the so-called geochemistry wing, when I heard this big, booming voice belting out a song by Stan Rogers. Now, any Canadian knows that Stan Rogers is one of the country's most iconic folk singers and writers. So hearing a Stan Rogers song in the corridor of a building in the middle of New Jersey would bring any patriotic Canadian to a screeching halt. And from that time onwards, a friendship was born. I had the privilege of getting to know not only Bear, but his wonderful family, which at the time was comprised of his wife, Maria, and children, Christina and Sean. I remember thinking how impressive Bear was. Trying to do a PhD while being single was hard enough, let alone doing it while raising a family. And I remember thinking how impressive Maria was. Although she was a fully qualified medical doctor in Canada, I remember hearing all about the many trials and exams she had to go through to eventually become licensed in New Jersey. More on that later. One of the best things I remember about those Princeton days was how tightly knit the grad students were. Although we had our own little research groups, for example, Bear was part of a large stable of geochemistry graduate students, contemporaries who included Trish Dove, Roland Hellman, Remy Hennett, and many others too numerous to mention, while I was a member of the geochronologically inclined Argonauts, it was a truly collegial environment where it was easy to mingle, which is how we both came to know even those nerdy geophysicists such as Terence Barr, who wonderfully is also speaking to you today. After Bear graduated from Princeton, he landed a job at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. I was soon able to follow him down under when I went to the Research School of Earth Sciences at the Australian National University, or ANU, in Canberra, and we were able to catch up from time to time. And I was reminded yet again of Maria's remarkable fortitude after hearing about the trials and tribulations she faced yet again to become licensed in Australia. At this rate, I expect that she is now licensed to practice in about 94 different countries. After some years, I moved back to Canada, but this time Bear followed in my footsteps by moving to the ANU in Canberra in the Department of Geology and eventually the Research School of Earth Sciences. Yet because of my own strong ties to Australia, we managed to keep in touch and catch up whenever my own family came back to visit friends and family in Oz. I will always remember Bear as one of the friendliest and kind-hearted people I knew. He cared deeply for his family, for friends, and for students. He took time off work to visit my wife in the hospital in Canberra when she decided to make an unplanned overnight stay. He kindly took my youngest daughter to a hockey game when she was visiting Canberra. Bear is such an appropriate name for him. He was a big guy with a big heart. To Bear's family, I can just imagine him strolling down that corridor in Princeton or the ANU, boisterously singing the following chorus from this wonderfully rousing Stan Rogers song. Rise again, rise again. Though your heart it be broken and life about to end, no matter what you've lost, be it a home a love, a friend, like the Mary Ellen Carter, rise again. Farewell, Bear, you will be sorely missed. Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. Well, hello everybody, I'm Terrence Barr and um, it's a privilege here to, to talk today and share some of the wonderful things that Bear enriched my life um, with. I first met Bear um, when he came to Princeton in 1985. I was uh, just a year ahead of him um, doing my PhD there. And um, I remember um, Bear showing up 
they always took all the first year or incoming graduate students on a retreat so they could get to know each other and um, air really stood out. I, I'm sure you can't imagine that, but he did. Um, <laughs> not just physically, but he went around and knew everybody's name within a matter of a few minutes. And I remember him introducing himself, you know, Bear McFadden. And I said, oh, Bear, what, what is Bear short for? And he said, Ursus Horribilis. <laughs> um, it took me several years to find out his name his, his birth name was Derry, and um, I only knew his wife to call him that. I'm meeting several other people today that knew him otherwise, but um, he was always bare to me. Um, I keep thinking of phrases that really um, kind of catch my, my feeling of him. And the first is, he was a real scholar and a gentleman. Um, he came to Princeton to work in David Carrar's um, lab, um, to do a PhD under David Carrar. But he very soon became the heart and soul of the geochemistry group. Um, David Carrar was very ill. And shortly after Bear arrived, um, you know, um, in, in several of the more senior geochemistry PhDs um, finished, um, Bear was the one that was really left to I say raise the other um, younger PhDs in the geochemistry group. Um, he had an incredible experience he brought with him from his days in BC, and he just had a way of taking everybody under his wing. Um, I remember one of the things he really transformed was coffee time. The geochemistry group had this tradition for years of having coffee together every day. And until Bear came, it was just the geochemists that would but he, um, his office was two floors below mine. Mine was just next to the stairwell. And I remember hearing Dan Rogers wafting up the stairwell. Um, I only came out to find out later he liked to sing in the stairwell because the acoustics were so good. But it was like the Pied Piper calling me down. And um, I remember coming down and having coffee and um, Within a few months, most of the geophysicists were coming down, and then I think the geochronologists and other groups started coming down, and it became one of the lively centers for the department. Everybody would make sure to get in to start their day with the geochemist's coffee. And we talk about everything, but Bear, I, he liked to just use the Socrat the, Socrates method, Socratic method. Um, ask people questions. I was a geophysicist. I didn't have much time for geochemistry at first. Um, I He soon straightened me out and showed me the silly error of my ways. I was doing some modeling of Taiwan. And he kept asking, so what is that good for? And I said, well, I can figure out this and that. And well, what can you do with that? Before long, he had me learn in geochemistry. And one of my highlights of my time at Princeton was writing a paper together with Bear where he used geochemistry to guide all the geophysical modeling I did. Um, and that was, that was always the way. He, he was a teacher um, at every, every level. Um, the other thing that always really stood out was he liked to have a lot of fun. Um, it wasn't just about academics, though he certainly was a powerhouse there. The, the next phrase that comes to mind um, when thinking about Bear was, you know, best and fairest. He, he liked sports. He played sports with a passion. But one of the things he always taught me was that you played hard, but you never lost sight of sportsmanship. And um, he started the, the geology hockey team there at Princeton. We didn't have one before. He tried to teach me to skate, and I... I I did not succeed as several of the previous speakers did. Um, I never did play hockey with Bear, but I did love getting out and skating with them. What I did play, though, was intramural softball and volleyball. We co-captained the, the geology team there for several years, and um, I still remember one time that sort of epitomized. We, we got out there, and we played, and we liked to, to do our best, but this one game, um, Bear hit 
a nice infield line drive, which was unusual. He usually knocked the ball out of the park. Um, in this particular case, he decided he was going to run and beat the throw at first base. And he had a full head of steam up. And I, I was surprised how fast he moved for, for his size, but he was a sprinter too. And there was a very small first baseman, very inexperienced, that decided they were going to step in the way to try to stop Bear. We all held our breath. We saw this collision com coming. But in softball, I know some of the North Americans would know, and I, but just for those down under, softball is not a contact sport as hockey is. And um, just before the collision, he decided to spare this poor first baseman and dove out of the way. He did a roll. We thought there must be a broken collarbone or dislocated shoulder or something. And when the dust settled, he stood up and sort of shook himself. I think he was sore for a while, but he wasn't going to run over another player. Um, and it always stood out. Um, I remember also another instance playing volleyball where we started to argue a call. It was a championship game. We started to argue a call, and he just sat us all down and read the riot act to us. It's like, you don't question the umpire. Um, that's just not sportsman like. Um, more than that, though, the thing that I really admired for Baron, what he shared with me, was his family. I was a single grad student at Princeton. My, my immediate family at that time was living overseas, and I felt like I was a stray um, when it came to holidays, and the McPhail family adopted me. Um, I felt like I spent many Canadian Thanksgivings and a couple Christmases with them. Um, and I, I was welcomed in. I, I saw firsthand his love for his wife and his children. Um, and that was something that as the years continued, whenever we would talk on the phone, he would always give me a rundown, just glowing with pride at every, all of your achievements. Um, uh, I know, to reiterate what Jim Lee just said in the last talk, he was so proud of you, Maria, being licensed in three countries, um, and he was so proud of all the kids, all you kids. Um, I know, like, from when you were little, I would hear about all the little things each time, and as you grow, you know, grew up into such fine young um, people, um, you were his life. I feel like I take a lot of the inspiration I, I, I saw as a father, you know, with my own children. Um, and one other thing that he really shared, I mean, he showed up at my wedding. We had a very small family wedding. My wife and I, we got married quite late. And we were married um, just south of Kingston in upstate New York. He miraculously happened to be in Kingston visiting um, Jim Lee at Queens University and um, called me up the day before my wedding and said, I'm getting married tomorrow, Bear. He says, I'm coming down. And he was there. Um, he stood up at the reception after a wedding and sang Stan Rogers song, 45 years, which is a real gift. It's my wife, Marilyn, and my song now. And um, I would just like to say, you know, to Maria, to Christina, Christopher, Sean, and, and Joey, um, I love you all. And I'd like to just make a toast to bear. You're sorely missed. You will be sorely missed, my friend. Um, cheers. Cheers. Thank you very much. I would like to uh, thank the Bull MacPhail clan for organizing this event and giving me the chance to say a few words about Bear. It was absolutely wonderful to have the opportunity to sit down and think a little bit about 
the influence of bear on my life and it is incredible I have no idea what I will be without bear these days uh, I moved uh, from Switzerland to Monash University in 98 as a wide-eyed postdoc and bear really took me under his wing he was an incredible mentor always happy always patient and patience is not really my strong suit so bear had an incredible influence in helping me uh, over and over looking over papers doing very detailed work in the lab getting excited about all sorts of new things I had never thought about and some things that I'm still working on today and I'm still marveled um, I'm still amazed by by all those things so thank you bear for changing my life and making me a nosy eventually uh, one of my big achievements though is that I managed to get Bear and the Wolf family to spend a week holiday in Switzerland quite a few years back. Um, what I would like to show you though are a few pictures from our field trips in Australia. And I realized that over the years since we co-supervised my first ever honor student, uh, Neri Long, uh, in the Northern Flinders Ranges, we spent, we had quite a few trips there together with Bear. Um, this is a beautiful part of the world, especially after a little bit of rain. And we did a few crazy things out there. Uh, we managed to fly in that tiny little plane. Three of us, plus a pilot. Thanks God, the pilot was a very skinny, tiny person. <laughs> so Bear and Doug, the pilot, could actually fit at the front of the plane, but just most of Doug's was actually sticking out of the plane. Being on the field with Bear was a marvelous experience, really learning a lot. Bear is a detailed kind of guy, uh, and being on the field with him, learning how to sample, learning how to observe, learning how to record observations was a very, very intense experience. Uh, and you can see that everybody looks looks very, very serious and very concerned. I now realize that the last trip that we ever did together uh, to the Flinders was also one of our most adventurous ones. Uh, it had rained, which is pretty rare, um, the month before quite a lot. So we managed to get stuck uh, with the car. Bear, of course, had sleep at Nya. So the deal on that trip was that we were going to sleep in nice accommodation with lovely electricity for a sleep tiny machine. So almost none of us had sleeping bag or anything to, no tent suddenly, to sleep at night. It went down to 5 degrees C that night. Food was fine. We had a couple of very good Chinese good dudes, Mei Yuan and Yuan Tian. But Jesus, the night was cold. And you notice in the morning, this guy is still trying to uh, not wake up and, and enjoy the fire. But even Bear is, wear, is wearing quite a serious jacket. So, but the wonderful thing is that when this thing happens in a good company, this is actually fun. We were not in any danger. We had food. We thought we had plenty of drinks. Uh, so this was an adventure. So thanks again, Bear, for helping me through my career, for being such a great friend, for having such a great family. And I would like to uh, invite all Bears, postdocs, colleagues, and PhD students, all the people that he mentored through his career, to join us uh, to honor his scientific contribution and his life as a mentor, as an academic mentor uh, at the International Biological Association, which is an international conference which will be held in Melbourne in August 2018. So talk to me or John Mav if you're interested. We'll have their registration so it won't uh, break the bank. Thanks again. <laughs> Hi, 
Hi everybody, my name is Greg Houseman. Uh, I was 30 years ago, I was a young lecturer at Monash University and I've been there a few years, I guess. And uh, actually first, Terence, Terence joined the department as a postdoc working with me. And uh, a couple of years later, he said, oh, I've got some big news, Bear's coming. I didn't know who Bear was. Um, but actually, as soon as I met him, I thought, yeah, Bear, Bear is, he's a big man. He's, a, he's an impressive guy. It was, uh, he was really uh, a, a, a huge asset to the Monash University, uh, the department there. Um, I guess he first came as a postdoc and, you know, uh, soon he moved into a faculty position. And uh, I, I think, actually, it's fair to say he became rapidly the most responsible person in the department. It was, um, it, it, even though he was not the most senior. Um, I, I learned later that he'd come to geochemistry as a mature student, but he just had this infectious enthusiasm for everything. And as we've heard already, uh, you know, he would, he would pick on a subject and he would ask questions about it. So anyone new came into the department, sat down at coffee and said, what are you doing? You know, Tell us about it. And he'd go into the questions. And, and so soon, you know, he just had, a, I think he was a, a soak for knowledge in a sense. And, and actually lots of good ideas. And I'm oh, sorry, <laughs> lots of great ideas. Uh, he was able to, um, you know, grab hold of a subject and take it and, and wring whatever, whatever use he could out of it uh, and uh, really make a difference. I, the department at that time was it was a bit of a fractious place, you know. But Bear was a peacemaker. He he could, uh, you know, if feathers were ruffled, he'd go out of his way to talk to the people. He was always aware of how others perceived any given situation, and that's quite a that's quite a powerful capability, I think. You know, it it makes it makes it possible to, you know, to have a, a, a cohesive view to for a, a unit like that to work well when you've got people like Bear around who can who can actually uh, get people talking with each other get find a way out of you know resolving problems just asking the questions you know what do we need to do to fix the problem and I I think that that impressed me that he had that kind of capability um, I guess uh, one of his, the big successes that he had at Monash University I think was he set up a, a new kind of interdepartmental initiative it was a degree program in environmental science and this kind of thing, it's, it's not that easy to get going in a, in a university department. You know, we, we're all, all a bit compartmentalized. We're all focused on, on doing the things that we need to do in our own discipline. Um, but he, he could see the bigger picture. Uh, he, uh, you know, he, he could, as I said, get people together, uh, you know, get, get, uh, ask the questions. What do we need to do in order to make this work? And as everybody's aware these days, you know, in environmental science, in that last 20 years or so has just become the big thing. It's something we've all got to be aware about in, in all kinds of ways. Well, his specialization, uh, as I best understand it, was metal ions in, in uh, aqueous fluids. And, you know, you can come at this from all kinds of directions. Uh, in maybe, you know, how do all bodies form? Where do we get the, uh, the minerals that we use? But, but his direction after uh, getting this environmental bug was really about more about, well, let's deal with some of the problems we've got, not about how did those ore bodies get there, but how do we clean up those problems that have been created when, when you know, for, uh, we've, we've had mining operations in places, we've, we've maybe polluted a river and there's, there's uh, you know, a good deal of metals that in the sediments there that shouldn't be there. How do we attack those kinds of questions? And he, you know, he, he, was, uh, he had the vision, he had the, uh, the, the, the intellectual power to address the questions. Um, and actually, he had, I would say, uh, many students through the years who he led into these kinds of subjects. Uh, and it will have a big impact in the future on, uh, in Australia and presumably elsewhere. He, he had a, a big reputation around the world for the things that he did academically. Um, I, uh, I think what I, what I remember best about my time with Bear 
um, and we overlapped there for, I guess, eight, eight or nine years, was the, um, the family occasions. Because uh, I guess uh, my own children uh, uh, and uh, my wife, uh, we would get together with uh, Maria and the kids uh, and Bear uh, for family barbecues. Uh, I remember one occasion was the, uh, uh, the, uh, um, the Super Bowl. I, I, not knowing much about the Super Bowl, I learned all about it and uh, um, got uh, pancakes uh, and uh, lots of good conversation and good, good cheer. And there were, there were quite a few occasions like that and it was, uh, it was really one of the impressive things to see how their family worked. Um, you know, what a charming bunch of people they all were, really. Uh, and, and just uh, how they all cared for each other and thought, thought, about, uh, thought about each other. Um, I guess, uh, and I, I, you know, I'm reminded again by some of what we've heard already tonight, but of course that one, one time um, Bear and Terence say, oh, we're going down to a pub to listen to some music. You want to come with us? Uh, I said, oh, yeah, sure, that'd be nice. Um, so they, they, they take me down to this pub in South Melbourne and, and sure enough, there's, there's a band there. It's not Stan Rogers, but actually they're doing a pretty good imitation of Stan Rogers. And I, I think I'm, I'm never going to hear Barrett's Privateers again uh, without thinking of Bear. Uh, this, this was a big sign. And in fact, one time, a couple of years after that, he, he came back from Canada and he said, here, the CD of, of Stan Rogers. And it, it often gets played in, in my car when I'm traveling. <clears throat> um, I, he, Bear had one of the best grounded work-life balances of anyone I know. And that's, that's a tough thing. You know, a, a lot of us, uh, get tied up in our work. Um, but, uh, you know, Maria and, and, uh, and Christina and the boys, they're, they're a, a, a tribute to the way he lived his life. And, uh, you know, he, he, he was into music, he was into hockey, he was into the science. He, he had lots of time for everybody, whatever discipline they're in. And, um, you know, he, he had that infectious enthusiasm and, and it's, uh, it's going to be, uh, uh, you know, it's a great loss, I think, to myself and to everybody that, that we, uh, we, we'll miss him enormously. Thank you. Hello. Uh, I'm Ian Cartwright. I'm just going to keep this very brief. Um, when it was announced that this memorial was... Uh, uh, going on, I was uh, asked by um, friends and colleagues at Monash University just to say something on behalf of the many um, friends and colleagues that Bear had um, from his time at Monash. So um, we've heard a lot of personal anecdotes about Bear. I knew him uh, through work. Um, he and I were at Monash at roughly the same time in the early 90s. Uh, I'm still there. He left 10 or so years later. So as you've heard, these um, impact on uh, the university uh, was uh, uh, considerable. Um, I co-taught um, courses at Bear, and he was a great teacher. And um, he was always, uh, as we've heard, uh, willing to have a chat about um, uh, science or about politics or about hockey or about whatever. And um, he not only talked, but he um, set up um, voluntary seminars. So uh, for about three months, he ran a, uh, a lunchtime thermodynamics uh, seminar and people came and uh, he uh, shared his knowledge and uh, it was done in a very amusing fashion, uh, very warm hearted fashion, never spoke down to people, tried to get them to um, understand things and to bring people along. That was, uh, that was great. He was also a very uh, good supervisor to his students, to his honours students and PhDs, some of whom are here today, and to um, postdocs uh, that he also worked with. And I know his uh, guiding hand was um, uh, very well um, uh, appreciated uh, by all. And yes, he helped in the department and he was uh, a great colleague to organise things. Um, um, just by coincidence, I'm teaching a course tomorrow, a course in thermodynamics, and some lectures that Bear and I worked on um, all those years ago. So his legacy does live on through, um, through his teaching. 
Perhaps one anecdote, because you heard a lot about Bear's um, prowess in sport. Um, a few months after he came to um, Monash, we had a cricket game. No. <laughs> but he approached it with a great deal of enthusiasm and gusto, and um, it was great. So we all miss him. Um, when um, the unfortunate news of his uh, passing came, um, I was inundated by um, messages at Monash and people talking about him. He certainly made an impact. Many of the people he knew are still there, and uh, he's still hot and dear. So thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I was the I was Bear's first uh, PhD student. I wasn't the first to start, but I was the first to finish. Because <laughs> I remember the first PhD uh, PhD student of Bear uh, is uh, Simon Baker. He is a world champion of uh, race walking and spent three years with us and then left and went back to an uh, athletic track. And uh, he's an uh, Olympic uh, torch bearer as well. So as a, one bear's barbecues he brought along with the, the Olympic torch. We'll think about lightning in the barbecue with the, the Olympic torch. But he came late, the barbecue sausage already sizzling. So I met Bear in 1996 when I visited Australia for a few months. And uh, I, my host was David uh, Lambert, so I didn't have much to do with Bear. But uh, the corridor of that building is so narrow that if we see Bear in the corridor, we only see Bear in the corridor. <laughs> so, and um, just like other speakers said, his passion for people, passion for science, and passion is his love that uh, left his side. So we knew each other very quickly and uh, got along very well. And during my stay, I decided to apply for a PhD, but I didn't get a scholarship. So I went back to my home university, university in China, and the uh, life went on. But one year later, I received a letter, not an email, it's a written hard copy of a letter from my friend, who, who was a PhD student of uh, parents. There, I talked to Zhu uh, Wei in the tea room. You know, Bear always spent lots of time in the department tea room talk to all, of, all sorts of people. And he told Zhu Wei that, ah, oh, Wei Hua is a good guy. He has a very good record. So I should be able to get scholarships up in, apply again. So I did, and uh, Bear was right. I got scholarship, and I came back in 1998 to do PhD with Bear. So Bear changed my life and my family's life as well. And uh, I was a geologist before I do PhD with Bear, so I don't, don't have much experience in the lab. The first day in Bear's lab was disastrous. Was Bear showed me around the machines, so he reviewed everything, and uh, he showed me very specially made the quartz cubes, the quartz cubes that are used for measurement. Said, oh, these things are very expensive, you should be careful. Don't break them. I said, yes, sir, can I have a look? And took the cuvette from Bear's hand and dropped it on the floor and, then, <laughs> and then break it. I could see Bear's face turn red, but he was really kind and gently said, Oh, this, that's not very good. Uh, <laughs> don't break them again. <laughs> yeah, so I, there I can say now, in, for my whole life since then, I have never broke, uh, broken any. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, my PhD with Bear went really well because Bear taught me a lot and uh, I don't want to go very broad with the scientific terms, but we published a few papers in various journals and the Bear helped me writing a lot. And one Sunday we go to the department office to work on my paper and he was typing fast. Suddenly he turned, turned to me, turned his face to me and he said, he's blinking his eyes. Uh, I, should, I shouldn't do this. I'm writing a thesis for you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we, I managed to finish my PhD one too and uh, start a postdoc in Sydney to see how with the uh, print mechanist and Joel who just uh, speak before. And the bear was also about to leave uh, go to NAU. And uh, the last chat before we part, uh, bear told me two things which I still remember today. And first, he said, well, now you have the degree, remember, people can take any, 
lots of things from you, but they can't take away your degree. And the second thing he told me is, he said, I'm your PhD supervisor, you are my student. We bonded forever. <laughs> remember that. I said, oh. Yes, there, I, I remember. You know, I still remember. And in conclusion, because every paper we wrote, rather has a conclusion paragraph. I have a conclusion here. <laughs> bear like science and bear like people. And I would say science like bear too. Uh, because uh, the one proof is uh, bear PhD students uh, run, uh, both run around today, and other collaborators publish a paper in Science Magazine, which is one of the two most pre uh, prestigious journals in the world, but science like bear. And I also say people like bear too. Because we are all here, that's why. Thank you. Uh, my name is Neville Gibb. I'm neither from the academic community nor the hockey community, but I didn't want to let this, this occasion pass without me saying a few words about uh, Derry. I, I call him Derry rather than Bear. I don't know why, I don't think I've ever liked nicknames, and I had an enormous amount of respect and affection for him. And um, I'd just like to say, oh, I, I don't think I can say anything that hasn't been said better by other people, but I just would like to say some things. Um, I thought Barry was a very smart person. He was very smart. I suppose he wouldn't have got where he got in his, in his work if he wasn't, but. He was modest as well, and he made people feel at ease. And uh, he made me feel at ease in his presence, and I, I loved him for it. But once we went to uh, we went to the opening of the Arboretum, and there was an ANU stand there and a young girl handing out pamphlets and things like that, and she wasn't getting very many takers. But anyway, Derry went up and spoke to her, made himself known, and encouraged her in what she was doing. But you could tell by the look on her face how much she appreciated it. This was just a simple thing. He didn't have to do it, but, but he did it. I only knew Derry through my son, and I wouldn't have come into contact with him otherwise, but I was glad I did come into contact with him. Uh, I, I, I liked the time I spent with him. I would have liked to have spent more time with him you don't think that uh, people are going to die. You think we're going to go on forever. And I thought in the future I could spend more time with him, but unfortunately it didn't happen. I regret his death, and like everybody here today, I'll miss him. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Misty, and I'm a former student at ANU. And of theirs. Um, nearly four years ago now, I had the uh, great privilege of meeting there. And um, as quite often can happen, the bureaucratic red tape of universities, um, it nearly, I nearly wasn't a student there. Um, and there was the person who, who got me to AMU, who got me to Canberra uh, to study. Um, I'd like to share with you because I'm a child of. Technology. Thanks on my phone, but I'd love to share with you just some musings. Passing of my great friend and my dear mentor. What do you say when words are not enough? How do you articulate the absolute devastation you are suffering? How do you mourn honestly when your grief chokes you and suffocates you? It crushes you. When it is not socially acceptable to break down, to crumble, howl out with me. As you feel your very soul breaking, there is, and there is simply nothing you can do about it. When you curl up and cry and almost childlike, you just simply don't want it to be so. What do you do when there is nothing you can do? There are words like grace and passionate and dedicated and ruined. 
seems so hopelessly inadequate to describe a man of your caliber. In every sense of the word, you were a great man. Your dedication to your students, to your research, to your hockey, to your family, and to your friends was something to be humbled by. Three and a half years ago, you took me under your wing at ANU. You looked out for me. You protected me. You fought for me so many times in countless ways. You went into battle for me when I could no longer fight for myself. You offered me your hand and gave me strength, guidance, and direction to keep me on course when I lost my way. There were many times when you even helped gently slay the demons that plagued me when my own mind was my traitor, as it often was. Never were you too busy, whether it was for a cup of tea, a chat, or a tutorial on a subject that I was struggling with. Even if it wasn't a subject you didn't teach, you somehow knew it. And as was your way, you sat with me until I understood it. Although I can't promise I retain much of the thermodynamics and calculus. <laughs> I'm so very lost without you, Ben. I will miss seeing you walking down the corridors of RSCS, casually combing your beard. <laughs> I will miss hearing your voice with its Canadian list say, hockey, hockey, hockey. <laughs> Or listen to you excitedly tell me about your research on Lake George or showing me around your lab. I will miss the way you could reassure me in my anxious moments by simply smiling, leaning back with upturned hands and saying, you're awesome. Today is your birthday. Normally I'd bring you a chocolate chip muffin, find you in your office, put a candle it and sing happy birthday to you. This year I will be surrounded by all the many people who love you as we say goodbye to you and celebrate your amazing life. I miss you, great man. Someday I know we'll meet again. You'll be waiting for all those you loved at that big hockey rink in the sky. You can finally teach me how to skate as we planned and not just be astonished at how spectacularly I fall on the ice. <laughs> we can talk about how sore your back used to be from all the hockey, but both laugh at how stubbornly you refuse to do anything about it. <laughs> Thank you for being such a wonderful and deeply out of my life. You were my brilliant mentor and my very dear friend. And I still cannot have it my life now without me. So until we meet again, great man. Rest in peace. Love you. And I miss you. But I would like to share with you all now the small tradition that I had. Yeah. The candle stays lit. No. <laughs> And I would love for you to all join me in seeing their happy birthday for the last time. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you.
Good day, folks. I'm Brad Updike. And I guess I've been a colleague with Bear for, I don't know, 16 years, but it's really just been the past six or seven years when Bear and I really got close. Bear was my buddy. And we'd get together for coffee in the morning, lunch at noon, tea several times in the afternoon, and even did a little bit of science together. Bear was terrific company. He just always was. Bear had a dry sense of humor, which he loved to deliver with a straight face. And sometimes it took a little while to appreciate it. But once you did, it was worth a smile to you every day, and occasionally a belly laugh. One thing they were always getting me was when this would happen, we would just sort of deadpan and, and quit. And I'd chuckle. And some, some, well, sometimes you make it quit and it would just go over people's heads, and uh, I'd chuckle. And then he'd say with a straight face, I'm a funny guy. People don't realize it, but I'm a funny guy. So thank you, Maria, and Sean, and Chris, and Christina. Yeah. Um, thanks for thanks for having us. And uh, there's a lot of love here today. To paraphrase a famous book: Bear was patient. Bear was kind. Bear was slow to anger and rarely, rarely had a bad thing to say about anyone. In fact, he went out of his way to say good words about people. Bear was incredibly hospitable, and we've heard a lot about that today already. He would always be the first to invite a newcomer around for a cup of tea or coffee, and famously, one of his staff parties, which always included much good wine and good cheer. Bear was also musical, and he and I, uh, again, just only recently, got to singing together casually. We, we got to go out to Adelaide on a long road trip and uh, listen to lots of Stan Rogers, <laughs> sang a few songs. We also had this fantasy of starting a quartet together, and Arrow, who last year was here today, he was one of the others that was going to You're always dismissing that third, per fourth person. So if there's anybody here that wants to start a quartet in Bear's honor, just talk to Arrow and I. So Bear, my friend, rest well. And no, you were really, really a fantastically positive influence on so many people. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Steve. I'm not a geologist. I am from the ANU, but not from Bear's immediate area. I'll comment on that later, but my job today is to read you out a message from Matt, John Matt Bedinus, uh, one of a very close colleague. And I'll start his message now, which is not in big font, by the way. I don't know how to change things on Google Docs, I'm sorry. Matt has written, Bear was one of my best friends, not just because he was the nicest guy in the world but also because we shared so many interests and saw things the same way. I'm sure that every speaker will say that he was the nicest person we ever knew, which is true. But while it was his great asset, it also drove me nuts. I lived to hear him say something bad about someone and I was disappointed. He just wouldn't. <laughs> I first met Bear at Monash in 96, but I'd heard of him years earlier. While living in Virginia, I overheard someone talking about Kriar and saying that his last student was someone called Bear. The speaker said it in a manner suggesting this was not an appropriate name. Now I grant you it is an odd name, but it's short beat Berry, and what else could it be being possibly called? I forgot about hearing this name until years later when I met him at Monash. We immediately hit it off, and we've been great friends since. The next year, and he and I spent time in bars at a conference in Townsville, 
where I learned that drinking whiskey with a pair was a dangerous thing to do. He was so big it simply had no effect on him. This was long before he moved to ANU, and when he first moved to Canberra, he stayed with us while he looked at houses, and in his typical indecisive way, he had to look at a lot of houses. But one of my favourite memories is of our baby daughter, Zoe, sitting in his lap, and the contrast in size made her look microscopic. While staying with us, Sarah, my wife, and Zoe both learned to appreciate just how incredible UV it is a spectroscopy. I'll forget that. Spectroscopy technique is. I still think they don't know what it is, but they were certain that Bear loved it. Joe used to say, why does Bear bring back home top shelf ice cream, but when you do it, it's cheap, low fat stuff? <laughs> Soon after Bear moved out of our house, our son <laughs> Ulysses was born, so one of the few people our kids knew since birth was Bear. He was constant in their lives. They'll sorely miss him because he was always nice to them, something that kids only kids properly appreciate. Bear moved to ANU and took an Elphus next to mine, so I saw him nearly every day for a, a decade. Zoe used to visit me at work, saying, see you, and hightail it into Bear's office. While living with us, he'd sometimes drop Zoe at daycare, and she'd say bye and run in. Every time Bear would mention how he dropped it off his little daughter, she'd cry while he drove away, breaking his heart every time. That's the sort of guy Bear was. He was selfless in that he did little for himself. In fact, his professional life was hindered because he spent all of his time helping others and forgot to self-promote himself. And in the modern university, I'm afraid there's less appreciation of that kind of selflessness. Maybe that's why he retired. Now should be his time to do things for himself, but somehow I doubt it would have changed. I lost a great friend, my bridge partner, a key member of our wine club, an excellent co-worker. Who's going to make me coffee now? Coming to work won't be as much fun anymore. There's Matt's words. And I would agree, and because above all, Bear was hugely agreeable. Um, sometimes different parts of the university don't get on too well. But as a director of another school, I never knew Bear to have any judgment of something that was proposed other than was it a good idea. It didn't matter who owned the idea. It didn't matter who'd have the budget. If it was good for the students or research, it was a good thing to do. I only ever had one disagreement with Bear, and that was about the boundaries of permissible bluegrass tradition at the folk festival. <laughs> he was somewhat more strict in his definition than me, but the ANU is just that bit diminished without Bear. Thank you. Look, um, I'm going to go off script because there isn't that much time left here. So, um, so I just wanted to mention a few things and, and I really can't say anything too much that hasn't really already been said. So I, I thought it would be nice just to amplify a few of the things that have been said uh, simply in words. And these are words we've heard this afternoon uh, about their big heart. Modest, true friend. I mean, I, I personally used to love the way that um, Bear would come up to me and say, "Good on you, mate," when he'd really, really mean it. It meant a lot to me, and I'm sure he did that to many other people as well. Love of family, musician, passion, enthusiasm, teacher, positive influence on my life. I mean, how many people can you say this about? Mentor, ideas man, problem solver, peacemaker. Could see the big picture. Good wine. Hockey. Hockey. <laughs> hockey. <laughs> More hockey. I used to go swimming. I go swimming regularly down at the Phillip Pools. I know all about the hockey and bear being there um, coaching and doing and coaching everybody there and being involved and we knew about it from work as well. So I was surrounded by Bear's hockey. Um, I think the defining thing about Bear was that all the time that you spent with Bear was always good time. It was always good time. 
I just wanted to thank Misty for the image of Bear whistling and combing his beard at the same time. That was just a wonderful, beautiful thing about Bear. So just to finish off, um, this is sort of going back to my speech that I had written. Um, uh, Bear was a very special teacher, mentor, colleague, a true friend to all of us at the university. He really will be sorely missed. That said, he leaves an enormous legacy uh, that lives on with all of us in how he showed us how to think and ask the right questions, how to be great teachers, and how to treat and work with students and colleagues to bring out their full potential. I think that really defines Bear. So on behalf of all of us, thanks, big fella. And I just want a special thanks to Maria, Sean, Joe, Christina, and Chris for having shared Bear with us. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it was really during a recent term as director of the ANU's Research School of Earth Sciences that I came to better know Bear and to fully appreciate his value as a citizen in our community. And I want to, again, um, uh, emphasize, uh, recapitulate on a lot of what's been said already by sharing with you a couple of experiences, a couple of conversations that I had with him during that time. The first of those was at a time when we were looking to grow philanthropy in the school. And the idea was that we could put some icing on the cake, provide, enhance the student experience and provide opportunities for early career researchers. Uh, and right from the beginning, when I consulted with various senior members of staff, Bear was unreservedly enthusiastic about this idea. And that was a critical part of the momentum that led ultimately to the launching of a new ANU Earth Sciences Future Fund to serve those important purposes. The second conversation that I remember uh, with him very clearly was about retirement. Unfortunately, in this era, directors have to have conversations with their senior staff about retirement. But from the word go, Bear and I were on the same wavelength. We shared the view that timely retirement was important in order to create opportunities for the next generation of uh, uh, university academics. And our conversation, always harmonious and pleasant with Bear, moved quickly on to our aspirations for retirement and ways in which the school could uh, help uh, academics make uh, a transition from paid employment into a meaningful and productive retirement. So those conversations with Bear were very instrumental in setting some of the school policies of the day. And so I will remember Bear as a big man in the sense of somebody who always took uh, a broad world view. He rose above self-interest and saw clearly what was in the best interests of the community at large. Uh, he was consistently unselfish and very generous. So he was a very highly respected colleague and friend and will be sorely missed by all of us. Thank you. Bear was my coach, was our coach, wasn't just our coach. Two, three times a week, every week, year in, year out, we'd drag ourselves to the crummiest ice times, crack of dawn or last thing at night. Hockey season was filling ourselves out of bed at 4.30 and plunging into a camber morning so cold we got into your bones. Dragging ourselves to reach scattered across New South Wales, have our asses invariably roundly handed to us and then shaking it off to do it again next week. And he was there through it all, Always. Just this larger than life, huge, warm, boundless, exuberant, unstoppable force of welcome, enthusiasm, and joy. And joy in teaching, and joy in sharing joy. Great commitment, eh? I like your energy. 
The next time Thinkerdude was there for, well, that was absolutely terrible. Here's how you can fix it. <laughs> Andrew Neese, with a cheerful Canadian rising inflection, was there for, you know, literally everything I'm teaching you only works if you do this one simple thing that was literally the first thing I ever told you. <laughs> When a normal person would say, yes, I know it's cold, it's dark, it's 5 a.m., we're driving six hours to get beaten 11 meals twice in a row, no one wants to be awake, and I don't have to be here, and now my car reads your collective coffee box and whinging, they would say, of course it's a good day, it's coffee season. <laughs> I have it on good authority, though, that despite his truly exceptional gift for teaching, for inspiring in those not generally given to that sort of thing, commitment that could be politely described as bordering on lunacy. And for sharing his infectious story and something he loved, he approached coaching women with the same degree of trepidation one might hurting cats. If those cats were armed with rocket launchers, I'd falling out for reasons one didn't fully understand and also cried sometimes. And he had this blank, here in the headlights look that meant he'd realized you were going to talk to him, come hell or high water, and that there would be feelings, irrationality, crankiness, very possibly tears and unkind things to say about other people. Oh, 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 he'd say. <laughs> but then he'd listen and let you talk until you're tired. And then he'd clap you soundly on the shoulder with a hockey, 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 eh? <laughs> and somehow it really did just feel like it hurt you. Like he was right. Like life problems weren't so bad. And maybe, just maybe, we should enjoy the things we love and be a little kinder to each other. Not that he'd ever say anything so condescending and saccharine, but not even the most cynical among us could walk away from a bare heart to heart without feeling one, he was a little bit uncomfortable, and two, maybe he was right. I'm never going to forget the trip to Newcastle where Bear, Don, McCarthy and I piled into the McDonald mobile. We'd probably gotten as far as Braddon when Emma and I began extensively unpacking our dating lives at great length and at what I would conservatively estimate to be a fairish volume. It was about then that Bear realized it was not physically possible to crank the speakers on his phone up loud enough to drown out the personal lives of two 20 to 30 somethings with the soothing velvety tones of Stan Rogers and songs that rhyme the best game you could name with the good old hockey game six times. It was also about this time that he realized that Don's free road trip car cleaning had, for some reason known to neither God nor man, involved the removal of every single CD in the glove compartment, footwell, under the armrest, or wedged between the seats. I know this because they're looked. <laughs> and then he tried, with frenzied energy, to engage us in conversation about the Acton Shale, the Lachlan Falls belt, order or interaction, and extrapolating ionic data. With praise bravado, he attempted to launch a car wide a cappella sing along. But was beaten back by the sinking realization that we sang with a tunefulness approximately equivalent to a sack full of weasels being laboriously cut to death. <laughs> And then he started looking, looking with the feverish desperation of a man scrabbling at the stony bottom of a dry oasis for a muddly, muddy trickling of water for an iPod jack. Every crack, every crevice, every possible avenue or place one might conceivably be hidden, he searched and searched again with steadily mounting urgency and desperation. A Scottabesia, a Scottabesia, no one would make a car without one. <laughs> he muttered with the wavering conviction of a child telling himself that there were not, that they could not be monsters under the bed. Don hissed through gritted teeth, maybe not being as emotionally invested as he might have been in a 17-minute passionate debate in the back seat about the matter, merits of waiting three quarters of an hour to acknowledge the text from an object of interest over immediate reply. <laughs> I have been driving this van for 10 years. There is a one. <laughs> there has to be, he half sobbed, like a man who wanted to believe the universe was just. Scrambling frantically through the third manual he was downloading for some glimmering of hope that there was some corner that was missed. There, there is no fucking Jack. <laughs> Emma and I started in on the exact degree of separation that was needed to make hitting on your ex's friend quite cricket. If I'm being honest, I'm reasonably certain the conversation may or may well not have been well peppered with a fairish number of things that pretty much no one wanted to hear. Among the vast stretches of below the pontification on love, life, our personal spin on the meaning of things, in which we were deeply engrossed. I saw the naked flicker of terror in his eyes the exact moment it dawned on him 
but he was one hour into a five hour drive. <laughs> and that then we were going to drive home. <laughs> So I always like to say that my wife is much smarter than me at just about everything, but I have much better taste in women than she does in men. But I think we all agree that Maria has pretty exceptional taste in men. I don't think you meet many people in a lifetime who mean this much to so many wildly diverse people. He really believes that you should do what you love, love what you do, and do it well enough to be proud of. And that just rubbed off on anyone around him and made anywhere he was a better place to be. He really genuinely saw the best in everyone. And that made you want to be best to prove him right, even or especially when you weren't so sure yourself. Hi, my name is Don McDonald, uh, and I'm a colleague of theirs as well, uh, a colleague in his true passion. Uh, <laughs> As we have heard, there was a man of many talents, many interests, and many loves. Those fortunate to have spent time with Bear would surely be the wiser and the more worldly, for he was the most willing dispenser of his accumulated knowledge for all those interests he possessed. I know I will never be able to look at ripples in the sand on a beach at low tide without thinking of Bear, or driving along the highways between Sydney and Newcastle and not marvel at the stratification of the rocks without thinking of Bear, or listening to a Stan Rogers song without thinking of Bear, or watching the sunset with a glass of red wine without thinking of Bear. Yes, we have learned and shared so much from this giant of a man. But I want to talk to you about the fire that burned deep down in his soul. The one true passion in his life is raison d'être, maybe not as much as his family, but the true love, hockey. For Bear, hockey was where all his loves came to live in one place and represented the sum of all that he did. Hockey was the bedrock of his being, where the melodic rhythm of life and movement could be best practiced and displayed, where teaching found its most eager and willing students, and where everyone became a member of one big, growing family the hockey family, where he was the grandfather to all. In Bear's hockey universe, there were four distinct quadrants. There was Bear the hockey player, Bear the administrator, Bear the fan, and Bear the coach. Bear the hockey player was the everyday man, the guy who played because he loved the competition and for the only true reason that really counted, it was fun. He understood that hockey was a game and that it allowed us to maintain the childish wonder that playing games provided. However, being the academic, it allowed him to also see beyond the funny games. He knew that hockey, like all games, was a metaphor for life. If you worked hard, did your best, strived to improve, supported your teammates, and laughed at your own foibles, the game was infinitely more fun and enjoyable and would allow you to grow to be a better individual. He did his worldly best to impart these truths onto all he came into contact with as a player. The list of players with whom he played with or against was extensive. There were the members of the Melbourne Ice, uh, Night Owls, his first Australian team, and all his contemporaries in Melbourne. The Red Blacks, the team in our local sea competition, and all those who played in that competition. And his beloved Canberra Senators, of which I'm sure you've all noted the, the sweaters that we wear, with whom he played for 15 odd years, traveled the country playing in old timer tournaments. Watching Bear in one of these tournaments was a marvel, not necessarily for his hockey skills, but in the way he greeted people and how they greeted him. He literally knew everyone in the room and had everyone's contact details on his phone. All these players, many of them who are with us here today, are better people for having known Bear. And we all thank you for your sense of fair play, concern for well-being of others, and your undying enthusiasm that wound its tentacles through us all. 
I know our senator's change room is not the same without your positivity, your kind heartedness, and your moderating voice. I know, Bear, in your humble way, uh, no, I know Bear in his humble way would turn the tables and instead thank you for your camaraderie, your friendship, and the opportunity to be involved with each and every one of you. Bear was never one who would sit idly by when something needed to be done. He embodied the ideal of when you want something done, and done right, ask a busy person to do it. But Bear was busy. He never complained when things weren't going according to plan or how it was hoped that they should turn out. No, instead, he put up his hand and volunteered to lead from the front and to make positive change. This was Bear, the administrator. He served as president of Ice Hockey ACT on several occasions, during which time he rewrote the organization's constitution. He served as coaching director. He was a longtime presenter at coaching certification seminars, director of women's programming, director of the Australian Tier 2 Women's Ice Hockey League Eastern Division, he served as a chef de mission on several Ice Hockey Australia World Championship teams. He was a valued voice on hockey matters across the country whose opinions were eagerly sought in. He intimated to me that he, would, that he could see himself serving as president of Ice Hockey Australia as he felt that he had much to give for the development of the sport across the country. I have no doubt we would all have benefited from his guidance if he had the opportunity to fulfill that role. Bear was probably the epitome of the hockey fan here in Canberra. He attended games played by players of all ages and skill levels. He was at the rink to watch kids so they would be supported. He watched young men who believed they were modern day warriors because he loved their hunger for the game. He watched the women because they were the new kids on the block whose unbridled passion was an inspiration to him. He watched the Knights and the Brave because they were the best in the city. And he loved to watch his kids because, well, they were his kids. After, our, after work hours, Bear was always at the rink because he loved hockey, all forms of hockey. And as a result, hockey loved Bear. In Bear's hockey universe, it's in the last quadrant of his influence, uh, that we uh, feel most, that he's most appreciated and missed, and that is Bear the Coach. After his death, I put a wallpaper on my computer screen that has Bear as a coach. In that picture, Bear is in the middle of a group of players. He has his arms spread out wide, uh, and he's emphasizing some important point, uh, undoubtedly, bend your knees. <laughs> There is a distinct twinkle in his eye. There is an unmistakable smile on his lips. And the players are captivated by his larger than life presence and passion. This is the picture that is etched in my mind of Bear. The passion, the booming voice, the beard, the coach. Like all of us here, I had a deep and personal connection to Bear. Our friendship grew out of a mutual ad admiration for each other because of shared values and the love of the game of hockey. It was through coaching, though, that our friendship matured and deepened. And over the years, it seemed like we were always coaching together, two peas in a pod. We would share almost daily telephone conversations. He would greet me with his familiar, hello, coach, or hello, young guy, or what's up, babe? He always had a way to make me smile. Our conversations were the conversations shared by all good friends. But ultimately, these conversations always ended up in a way to discuss hockey and coaching. He was always looking for ways to improve as a coach and to improve the lives of those for whom he had the responsibility to coach. Such was the nature of our relationship, and it was one that I cherish. For the majority of the hockey people here today, your connection to Bear may not be as personal, personal as the connection Bear and I shared, but I am damn sure it was nonetheless as deep. For Bear touched us all in a way that only truly exceptional people can reach. 
because they're coached so many of you at some stage in your hockey careers, you've also been able to experience the warmth and humanity he emanated from his being and that endeared him to all. They are coached at many levels. Peewees, Bantams, and Midgets. He coached local development, learned to play for youth, for seniors, for women. He coached at national Peewee, Bantam, and Midget development camps. He coached state representative teams from Bantam age to senior men, including the old Canberra Knights. He mentored countless coaches, even if he wasn't officially a coach. Over the last years of his life, he took on a new responsibility, one that he absolutely loved, and that was helping to grow the nascent women's hockey program by coaching at the club and representative level, as well as at the national level with the Canberra Pirates. He, was truly he, uh, he has truly touched everyone from all ages and gender. One would be hard pressed to find a hockey player in Canberra who hasn't had Bear as a coach at some point in their career. And Bear's coaching wasn't confined just to the bench. I've heard countless tales from players who said that Bear was always helping them with positioning and technical hints to improve their game, all while he was playing on the ice against them. <laughs> Once a teacher and a coach, always a teacher and a coach. To understand Bear's influence as a coach is not to know that he coached everyone, because he did coach everyone. It was that it was what and how he coached. For Bear, a coach took on the incredible responsibility of maintaining the well-being of a group of young and increasingly some not so young men and women. This responsibility meant that a coach must always have the best interests of the group and not an individual at the heart of all that's done. He taught that success could only come through hard work, through commitment and dedication to the task. Respect for each other in the game was always the highest principle to maintain. Treat everyone as you would want to be treated yourself. It was better to emphasize the good and find a way to improve as, to, as criticizing the bad and belittling a player for mistakes. And at the end of the day, hockey is a game and the only reason to play games is to have fun. Bear understood this probably better than anyone I know. And I think, Bear, this is your lasting legacy. Bear, you were my teammate, my co-coach, my mentor. But more than that, you were the big brother I never had. You were my confidant. You are my best friend. I miss you terribly. As we have this final gathering to celebrate your life and your contribution to others' lives, I salute you with the words that brought so much happiness to those uh, who you touched. Hockey, hockey, hockey. It's a great day to play hockey. <laughs> Hello to Bears family and friends. Um, I'm really sorry we won't be able to make it this Sunday. Uh, Rosie and I are in a choir and, uh, and we have our performance this weekend on Sunday. So we just can't make it down to Canberra. Otherwise, um, we, we definitely would have. Um, it's something that we really wanted to do. Uh, Bears has been an important part of our life. The whole family has. And um, I'm very sorry we can't make it. Um, even though I'd heard of Stan Rogers before I met Bear, um, he, was, he was the one who really introduced me to him in detail. I think I had a, a tape of Stan Rogers pirated from Bear for a long time before I actually went off and bought all the, the equivalent um, CDs on iTunes. Um, and, uh, and what I want to do now is to, uh, to, to sing one of my favorite Stan Rogers songs. I'm, I'm not sure if it was one of Bear's favorites or not, but, uh, but it's a great song and uh, you can play this or not. Um, Bear would have sung it better than I would have, um, but, but, uh, but here it is, Barrett's Privateers. Oh, the year was 1778. How I wish I was in Sherbrooke now. 
When a letter of mark came from the king to the scummiest vessel I've ever seen, God damn them all. I was told we'd cruise the seas for American gold. We'd fire no guns, shed no tears. Now I'm a broken man on a Halifax pier, the last of Barrett's privateers. Oh, Elkled Barrett, cried the town, how I wish I was in Sherbrooke now. For twenty brave men, all fishermen, who would make for him the antelope's crew, oh, damn them all. I was told we'd cruise the seas for American gold, we'd fire no guns, shed no tears. Now I'm a broken man on a Halifax pier, the last of Barrett's privateers. Now the antelope sloop was a sickening sight. How I wish I was in Sherbrooke now. She list to port and her sails in rags, and the cook in the scuppers with the staggers and jags. God damn them all. I was told we'd cruise the seas for American gold. We'd fire no guns, shed no tears. Now I'm a broken man on a Halifax pier, the last of Barrett's privateers. On the king's birthday we put to sail, how I wish I was in Sherbrooke now. We were ninety-two days to Montego Bay, pumping like madmen all the way, god damn them all. I was told we'd cruise the seas for American gold, we'd fire no guns. Shed no tears, now I'm a broken man on a Halifax pier, the last of Barrett's privateers. On the 96th day we sailed again, how I wish I was in Sherbrooke now. When a bloody great Yankee hove in sight, with our cracked foul ponders we made to fight, God damn them all. I was told we'd cruise the seas for American gold. We'd fire no guns, shed no tears. Now I'm a broken man on a Halifax pier, the last of Barrett's privateers. Oh, the Yankee lay low down with gold. How I wish I was in Sherbrooke now. She was broad and fat and loose in stays, but to catch her took the antelope two whole days. God damn them all. I was told we'd cruise the seas for American gold. We'd fire no guns, shed no tears. Now I'm a broken man on a Halifax pier, the last of Barrett's privateers. At last we stood two cables away, how I wish I was in Sherbrooke now. Our crack four pounders made an awful din, but with one fat ball the Yanks stove us in. God damn them all. I was told we'd cruise the seas for American gold. We'd fire no guns, shed no tears. Now I'm a broken man on a Halifax pier, the last of Barrett's privateers. All the antelope shook and pitched on her side, how I wish I was in Sherbrooke now. Barrett was smashed like a bowl of eggs, and the main truck carried off both me legs. God damn them all. I was told we'd cruise the seas for American gold. We'd fire no guns, shed no tears. Now I'm a broken man on a Halifax pier, the last of Barrett's privateers. Now here I am in my 23rd year. How I wish I was in Sherbrooke now. It's been six years since we sailed away, and I just made Halifax yesterday. God damn them all. I was told we'd cruise the seas for American gold. We'd fire no guns, shed no tears. Now I'm a broken man on a Halifax pier, the last of Barrett's privateers. Maria, our condolences to you. Christina, Sean, Christopher, Jonathan. I've lost a parent, but not as, not as young as you lost a parent. 
Um, it's a hole that you're never going to fill. Um, but life will go on. And if your experience is like mine, you will never forget him. We'll never forget him. Bear was a wonderful friend. We didn't have much to do with him in the last little while, but whenever we met up, it was like, like uh, we had never uh, lost contact. So I hope you all get um, whatever you can um, that's good from, from this get together of, of all of Bear's friends and acquaintances. And, and once again, I wish on behalf of Rosie and the rest of our family that we could have been there. Um, love from all of us. Bye-bye. Hi, everyone. I'm a little nervous <laughs> and cold. Um, some of you may not know me, but I am Chris, uh, and I'm my dad's favorite child. <laughs> Not fun, it's true. Um, <laughs> this year has been the hardest of my life. Uh, and a lot of that is because Dad made life so easy before. I could always count on him to answer some of my more serious questions. And sometimes he would just give me money. <laughs> <laughs> it's not something that I ever really needed, but he liked to help in any way that he could. And that was really what defined him as a person. He was nice to everybody. You guys have heard all that already. Uh, but it was sometimes a hassle as the rest of us would sit in the car while he made his final goodbyes to everyone. And you only really appreciate that now uh, when you see so many people here and how many people have so many fond memories of my dad. And yours are mostly good memories. Uh, but my siblings and I know, know better than most is uh, more angry side. <laughs> But it's not to say he never really got angry. He was just very, very disappointed. <laughs> it's really hard for me to get up here and speak about my dad. Uh, he was my friend. He was my mentor. And as the year goes by, more and more happens without my dad. I realize how sad I am and that we all are. But he's no longer that constant. He can always count on for advice. He taught everyone so well, and though ever the constant academic, he would often pad any lesson with, do as I say, not as I do. More often than not, I find that his, his advice was really a positive influence on my life. He gave many lessons, those, his most important lessons to my brothers and my sister, and, and to I, were to be nice to people, to be intelligent, and to not be afraid to try new things. It's in these three things that I know my dad. He was always nice to people. And for the most part, he was very intelligent. Though sometimes he didn't really demonstrate it, but that was mainly because he was trying to try too many new things at once. And so many people have told me stories and have just told us stories about how my dad helped them. And it makes me a little jealous that so many people are here today. But I also thank everyone for being here today. And that jealousy is just infinitesimal compared to the pride and joy in knowing that he helped and influenced all of you in some way. I know that the advice he has given me will stay with me forever as I try to be the person he wanted me to be. He was a great dad and he will be missed. Thank you. She went down last October in a pouring, driving rain. The skipper he'd been drinking and the mate he felt no pain. Too close to Three Mile Rock and she was dealt her mortal blow. And the Mary Ellen Carter settled low. There was just us five aboard her when she finally was awash. 
We'd work like hell to save her, all heedless of the cost. And the groan she gave as she went down, it caused us to proclaim that the Mary Ellen Carter would rise again. Well, the owners rode her off, not a nickel would they spend. She gave twenty years of service, boys that met her sorry end. But insurance paid the loss to us, so let her rest below. Then they laughed at us and said we had to go. But we talked to her all winter, some days around the clock. She's worth a quarter million afloat and at the dock. And with every jar that hit the bar, we swore we would remain and make the Mary Ellen Carter rise again, rise again, rise again. Let her name not be lost to the knowledge of men. All oh, those who loved her best and were with her till the end will make the Mary Ellen Carter rise again. All spring now we've been with her on a barge lent by a friend. Three dives a day in a hard hat suit and twice I've had the bends. Thank God it's only sixty feet and the currents here are slow. Or I'd never have the strength to go below. But we patched her rents, stopped her men's dog hatch and porthole down. Put cables to her fore and aft and girded her around. Tomorrow noon we hit the air and then the strain and make the Mary Ellen Carter rise again, rise again, rise again. Let her name not be lost to the knowledge of men. All oh, those who loved her best and were with her till the end will make the Mary Ellen Carter rise again. Hi, everyone. I first met Bear. Hold on one way. second. Hold on, sorry. We have found we should have tested this first. We just need to do a few things to make sure that you guys are coming through the studio. All right, try again. Say something. I first met Bear. Nope. Nope. <laughs> we promise we'll let you speak at some point. Couldn't leave her there, you see, to crumble into scale. She'd saved our lives so many times, living through the gale. And the laughing drunken rats who left her to a sorry grave, they won't be laughing in another day. And you, to whom adversity has dealt the final blow, with smiling bastards lying to you everywhere you go. Turn to and put out all your strength of arm and heart and brain And like the Mary Ellen Carter, rise again Rise again, rise again Though your heart it be broken on life about to end No matter what you've lost, be it a home, a love, a friend Like the Mary Ellen Carter, rise again Rise again, rise again Though your heart it be broken or life about to end No matter what you've lost, be it a home, a love, a friend Like the Mary Ellen Carter, rise again We'll see you later.